So my talk is called A Drug Center View of Drug Development. But first, I will talk a little bit about my myself. I'm a member of the data science group at Roche R&D. The data science group has a mixed capabilities model. That means that it includes experts in different areas of computational biology, such as cheminformatics, bioinformatics, data and text mining. And our work is to develop, uh, to support drug, drug projects in all their needs in, the, in these areas by bringing together expertise from all these fields in one group. So my talk is based on this article from Plus Computational Biology of last year. And it's the, in the title, it says it's a drug strength view. What, I'm, what it means is that uh, we are trying to, I'm trying to see the drug development process from the point of view of the drug. And just to make this talk more, a bit more entertaining and also to help you remember more of the things that I'm saying. I created this character called Druggy, which is an average drug. And this is a storytelling device uh, that hopefully will help you understand a bit more the concepts that I'm explaining. So what do I mean by a drug first? So in this case, for this talk, for this uh, study, I don't mean only FDA approved drugs. I mean, any, any drug that has been under pharmaceutical development. So this is a broader definition. And the reason for doing this is mainly because the number of FDA approved drugs is quite small. And so there's not enough data to do such an analysis. Uh, the data sources that I used for this study were clinicaltrials.gov uh, with the help of uh, stitch annotations, Medline with the help of the GenView tool, and the sideline trial to uh, database, which is a proprietary database. So how does the world look uh, from the point of view of a drug? So the goal of a drug is to be, uh, treat a disease. But there are many things that have to happen before a drug is approved uh, to be to, for a disease. There's a drug development maze, so to speak. Uh, a drug has to... Uh, have a number of properties, uh, has to uh, pass a number of requirements, such as having the appropriate PKPD properties, appropriate efficacy or safety levels, and also has to compete with other drugs that are also trying to treat the same diseases. On the other hand, the a drug has a number of properties that can help move forward in this process. So it has a number of, uh, it has a certain value and two of the things that uh, define this value are this scar one is scarcity. Uh, by that I mean that uh, the drugs are costly to develop. They're there's also a limited uh, drug space, at least a bioactive drug space, they, which means that whenever there is a, a drug design, uh, say, against a certain target, the drug designs tend to converge so that's telling us that there are not so many options in terms of drug design. Moreover, there are many more design constraints such as phys physiochemical properties, viability requirements, and so on, that actually make us, uh, add the number of drugs that are developed not so uh, large because of these two constraints. Moreover, a drug has, is poly can be quite polyvalent. So because the diseases have uh, pathological processes that overlap, there are drugs that can treat a certain disease and also can treat similar diseases. And there are also effects of drugs that are unintended or off target that could actually be positive. So it's, uh, a certain drug that was the in principle developed for a certain disease can turn out to have positive effects on other diseases. My talk is going to be mainly talking about these intrinsic values of drugs. And I will talk a bit briefly about the scarcity and then mostly about polyvalency. So how a drug can address many diseases and how this process uh, happens. So first, we can see in this graph that the number of studies per drug in that have been happening over the years uh, have, has, been, uh, has been increasing. So there are more studies being done for any particular drug. That means uh, that the, that points out to a certain level of scarcity of drugs. 
So it's even though there are more and more studies being done, the number of drugs do it doesn't increase as quickly, as rapidly as the number of studies. However, there is a, a high level of inequality. So there are drugs that have a much larger level of attention, a much larger share of studies than others. So the top 20% of drugs actually takes the, occupies 60 to 70% of all clinical studies. This is not, uh, although this is a high level of inequality, this is not a Pareto level of in, uh, inequality, uh, mainly because the, the drugs, there seems to be some sort of a limit in the number of total studies that a certain drug will take. So there is no, there's a bit of upper limit in the, in the market, if you want to, so to speak. Now, as I said, drugs can be polyvalent. They can uh, be used for many diseases. And this is interesting part of their value. And w this is not a static picture. That means, at the be first of all, at the beginning, we don't know exactly for which diseases a drug can be, treat, uh, can be used for. This can change during the development of a drug. If a drug fails against a disease, it doesn't mean that that drug is not useful. It could be used against another disease. Many of you may be thinking about repurposing. Repurposing is just a specific case with of, of what I'm talking about. Because uh, usually we think about repurposing of, for example, a drug that has been discarded, that has been abandoned, and then is taken uh, once again later on, maybe for a completely different disease. But this process of pairing a drug with a disease happens continuously over the entire pharmaceutical pipeline and also afterwards when a drug is marketed. There is there's always a search for potential indications for drugs. Uh, and that points out, again, to the value of a particular drug. But once you have it, you want to extract them as maximum uh, value out of it. So the question is, can we model this dynamic uh, uh, situation where in which drugs are, m are tested into different diseases over time? So let's go back to our friend Draghi, which is an average drug. And originally it was created for disease A, and that's when the drug was born. Later on, uh, it was applied to disease B and to disease C. Now, we don't know exactly whether this is what happened, whether the success of, of the drug in disease B led to disease C, or whether we have a different picture in which the, the success of the drug in disease A led to the drug being applied to disease B or disease C. We actually have to look uh, to a lot of uh, statistically to the data available to see whether any of these paths is more likely than the other. In order to do that, we need a model to analyze the data. In this case, I apply this telecommunication model, which uh, is a messaging network in which the disease are, diseases are the nodes of the network. And the connections represent the strength of the con uh, the strength of this relationship between diseases. So, how often do they send drugs uh, between diseases? As you c so, whenever there is and to explain a bit more this model, whenever the drug is uh, at a certain time applied to disease A, it can be then applied to disease B in time one, and then to disease C in time two. And then you also have drugs that may ap be applied for a disease, but then are not, do not get passed into other diseases. So the model has to be, to account for those cases as well. <coughs> In order to resolve this model, um, I applied as a Poisson process uh, analysis, which is typical of communication networks, in which the, uh, the average time that uh, a drug is passed into a, from one disease to the other, or from one node to the other, is uh, it's re dependent on the lambda of the Poisson process. And using all the data that I mentioned from the clinical trial uh, studies, we can resolve this model and uh, estimate this average time that a, a drug takes to be passed from one disease to another. And these connections tell us how strongly linked these diseases are, meaning how likely is the drug that is used for a certain disease will be applied to another disease. 
Now we can create networks such as the one I'm, I'm presenting here. This is particular for uh, inf uh, autoimmune diseases. And these networks have present certain properties that are uh, help us understand the drug uh, development process a bit better. So for example, we can see some nodes that are more highly connected. That means they have a stronger relationship to other diseases within this class. And in particular, some of the nodes tend to be, to have a higher out degree than in degree. So for in, in our case, transplantation is a node that has a high out degree. And, and this tells us that there are a lot of drugs that are first tested for transplantation, and then they are tested for other autoimmune diseases. Conversely, we have a node such as rheumatoid arthritis that has a high in degree. And that means the drugs that are tested in other autoimmune diseases are then used in rheumatoid arthritis. This all can be, as this you could explain this by saying for rheumatoid arthritis is a disease for which there is a high um, unmet need. And therefore, whenever there is a drug in another autoimmune disease, um, tested in another autoimmune disease that has been successful, that drug could be tested then later in rheumatoid arthritis. Similarly, you can see in the network that there are some nodes that are less connected. That means they are possibly not very related to the other diseases in this network, which is the case, for example, in our here. This is an, another example for uh, lymphoma diseases, where you also find nodes with high in degree and out degree, and also nodes that are very loosely connected to the network. And by the biology, we can see that the they have a very, uh, not, not a strong pathological relationship. So we can think of the, uh, drugs as technologies that express, uh, spread contagiously from disease to disease. And the drugs that are successful, they tend to spread the, across many more diseases in a kind of viral fashion, if you want. Now, if we, go, if we look at the static picture, we can see, we can create this drug-centric uh, disease classifications where certain similarities within diseases are highlighted because these diseases are sharing drugs that have been tested for, th for them. So obviously because they share pathology, the pathology, because they have symptoms in, in common, because they have anatomical similarities, for example here kidney diseases are grouped together, or because they have comorbidities, or they are comorbid. Here there is another example of uh, such clustering in which you can see how it compares with the human taxonomy. So in the human taxona, taxonomy, which is, uh, represents the colors, um, there are some classifications that are driven by maybe uh, certain criteria that, are, that do not reflect the drugs that are applied for this disease. For example, multiple sclerosis in the taxonomy was considered a CNS disease, but the drugs that are used for multiple sclerosis tend to be typical drugs for autoimmune diseases. As conclusions, I, as I have been uh, showing, we can learn a lot from looking at the drug development process from the point of view of the drug, and not just uh, in terms of repur repurposing. And doing this kind of network modeling analysis can help us to plan for future indications of drugs. Moreover, we can group the, uh, diseases according to the drugs that are being used to treat them, and that tells us a bit more about the state of the art of uh, drug development. I want to acknowledge some of my colleagues at Roche and thank you for your attentions and for any questions that you may have. <laughs> Enoch, please. <laughs> Hi, Rul. Great talk. Good to see you again. Um, so you asserted towards the beginning that just because a, dr a drug trial fails isn't the game over for the drug for approval mm -hmm. overall. And of course, there are some celebrated examples, including Viagra, that has shown that. But in general, I've seen studies that show that the first indication is usually the best chance for approval. In other words, drugs that fail in the first indication don't make it, even though they've been tested, whereas drugs that succeed in first indication, then you can find other indications. Have you seen this as well, or do you think? So that's a very good point. I didn't, I should have asked you about it before uh, trying to do this study, because it's, uh, it looks a bit, we didn't look into that. I mean, where you can see, I, I think maybe in those cases, the probability of failure is high, but then you also have cases where drugs are being tested for many diseases at the same time. And for some of them, they, f they fail, and I could, mentioned some recent examples, but maybe this particular case when the 
the first indication kills the, the attractivity of the drug, right? Because no one else wants to get into that uh, use that drug anymore. Or it could be that the first hypothesis is generally the best one, and then the other ones, you know, it's not impossible, but just increasingly. Yeah, I mean likely. that's yeah. yeah, that's a potential explanation. Thanks, Thanks Ina. Um, interesting talk, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so have you attempted any predictions on based on your network? And if yes, is there any insights that you can share on surprising no, things maybe? I mean, I propose this as a way to model our portfolio. So trying to run our, the drugs that we are developing and trying to see which potential indications could come based on this modeling, right? So if you look at the history of a certain drug, whether we can tell which one, which other indications we should be looking at, but there hasn't been a lot of enthusiasm. I think. Sometimes the thinking in the industry can be a, it's hard to change in this kind of situations. 